Good evening. The headlines tonight, the 15th of August, 1945. Japan has surrendered. Britain and much of the world is celebrating Victory Day, the first day of world peace after six years of war. Tonight, the King addressed the nation from Buckingham Palace. From the bottom of my heart, I thank my peoples for all they have done, not only for themselves, but for mankind. The Prime Minister, Mr. Attlee, says Britain has to work hard to win the peace, as we have done to win the war. Peace has once again come to the world. Let us thank God for this great deliverance and his mercies. Long live the King. In Tokyo, the Emperor Hirohito announced the surrender to weeping crowds. He said a new and most cruel bomb had caused Japan to surrender. In London this morning, His Majesty performed the state opening of Parliament. The royal procession was watched by a huge crowd in spite of the rain. This evening, even larger crowds were blocking the West End. The scenes are floodlit. There are bonfires and there are fireworks. It's a climax to a day of rejoicing. And with the war over, the tourist trade is booming as Britons take their first seaside holidays for six years. The Second World War is over. Japan's unconditional surrender announced at midnight last night by the Prime Minister, Mr. Attlee, brought to an end hostilities which lasted just three weeks short of six years. Throughout much of the world, today has been a day of celebration. In London, huge crowds have gathered outside Buckingham Palace, from where tonight the King has broadcast to his people here and overseas. He said we all have our part to play in restoring the shattered fabric of civilization. If you carry on in the years to come, as you have done so splendidly in the war, you and your children can look forward to the future, not with fear, but with high hopes of a surer happiness for all. It is to this great a task that I call you now, and I know that I shall not call in vain. News of the Japanese surrender was given simultaneously in London, Washington and Moscow. President Truman told the American people, this is the day we've been waiting for since Pearl Harbor. Here, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill, said in the House of Commons, total war has ended in absolute victory. Tonight in London, after this amazing end of the war day, vast crowds are still out. Here, demanding yet another appearance of the King and the Royal Family. And just a few minutes ago, they were rewarded. With the floodlights on again, His Majesty and the Queen and the two princesses appeared for the fourth time, with the crowd still demanding more. This day of peace at last began unexpectedly with Mr. Attlee's broadcast at midnight last night. Japan has today surrendered. The last of our enemies is laid low. Here at home, you have a short rest from the unceasing exertions which you have all borne without flinching or complaint for so many dark years. Peace has once again come to the world. Let us thank God for this great deliverance and his mercies. Long live the King. By coincidence, it was also the state opening of the new parliament. And, braving the rain without raincoats, the King and Queen delighted the crowds by insisting on the open state landor. Although they'd voted in the new Labour government, the crowds had special cheers for Winston Churchill as they waited and danced all over the West End. And, gathering in a veritable multitude, including all over the monuments, in front of Buckingham Palace, chanted for repeat appearances of the royal couple. When they had last appeared, there were such roars that Princess Elizabeth at the left and Princess Margaret Rose on the right looked amazed as well as delighted.
as Mr Attlee was to tell the Commons after the King received newly elected Labour cabinet ministers, the royal couple's example in the war had strengthened the bond, uniting them to their people. And there were many different people celebrating. In London's Chinatown, there was special delight the long nightmare of their people under the Japanese was over. And the Yanks as well were to the fore in all the dancing, with the new jitterbug obviously a hit. It wasn't difficult to get the crowd singing all the old favourites that have seen us through these long years. Around the country, street parties were lit up with long-forgotten fireworks and the bonfires were let rip. It's the sort of night that nobody wants to end. The celebrations in the United States have been described as wild, the greatest in the history of the nation. America, of course, has borne the heaviest burden of the war against Japan. But as they rejoiced that it was over, many, like Mayor LaGuardia of New York, felt there was one important person missing. There's 130 million Americans tonight are giving thanks to God Almighty for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The party broke out last night in the streets of New York, exploded in some cases, and the world was invited. The war against Japan had ended at 7 o'clock East Coast time, three months after the victory in Europe. President Truman made the cautious announcement from the White House in Washington. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of the surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. But by today, all restraint had gone, and New York's Times Square was full of cheering and songs for those who'll be coming home and tears for those who won't. These scenes are being repeated in cities across America. They called it the greatest celebration in America's history. For Americans, it's been a different conflict, they went away to war, but the war never came to them. Their cities weren't attacked, their factories weren't destroyed. Today, they can pick up where they left off. No rubble in their streets, no unexploded bombs, just the champagne and the laughter, and a new future that begins today as the most powerful nation on Earth. It's reported that Emperor Hirohito wept when he told the Japanese cabinet that he intended to surrender. In a radio broadcast, he referred to the defeat in vague terms. The war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, he said, while the general trends of the world have all turned against her interests. It was the first time the Japanese people had heard their emperor's voice. Many of them fell to their knees and wept. Today, millions of Japanese, forewarned of the momentous broadcast, gathered to hear the Emperor's words. He told them that a new and most cruel bomb with incalculable power was being used against his country and that continuing to fight risked the collapse and obliteration of Japan and possibly humanity itself. Most people had never heard him speak before, and many people broke down, wailing, Forgive us, O Emperor, our efforts are not enough. For much of the war, the Emperor remained isolated from the suffering of his people, shielded from reality by a heavy curtain of imperial pomp and ceremonial. His status as a god king meant few Japanese ever saw him, and his rare public appearances were carefully stage managed. But since the firebombing of Tokyo in March, a single raid by American heavy bombers led to the deaths of 200,000, the emperor began to survey the physical and human destruction for himself. Since the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki last week, in which hundreds of thousands of people are believed to have died, there's been little doubt that Japan would have to accept the Allies' Potsdam Declaration of Surrender Terms. 
Only the Minister of War argued against it, and today there's news that he's committed suicide. But despite Tokyo's offer to surrender to the Allies, Japanese troops continue to resist the Russians advancing into Manchuria. Since the launch of their campaign six days ago, Russian columns have advanced deep into the Manchurian heartland, and they're reported to have reached the border with Korea. The true extent of the casualties of the two atomic bombs is so far unknown, but according to our science correspondent, the survivors of the A-bombs are now starting to experience the lethal effects of what's known as radiation. He's compiled this report from the latest information available. It's now known that the atom bomb was first tested last month in the New Mexico desert. It's devastating power witnessed by relatively few. Nine days ago, a single bomber used it for real, and its destructive force has stunned the world. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. Only now are the terrible effects of the atomic explosions becoming apparent. Both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, hit three days later, have sustained appalling damage. The death toll is believed to run into hundreds of thousands. In Hiroshima, everything within one and a half miles of the center of the explosion was flattened. People were vaporized. Within three miles, thousands were burnt or crushed by collapsing buildings. But now, those who survived are suffering from a new and terrible sickness, radiation. As the bomb exploded, invisible gamma rays were released. The deadly effects are only just becoming apparent. Doctors, used to dealing with burns, are now having to cope with radiation sickness, which few have seen before. The bone marrow in these people will have been destroyed by the radiation. They're suffering from nausea, vomiting and fever. Their hair is falling out and they're bleeding internally. Doctors fear few will survive. As Hiroshima lies in ruins, the American government has sharply denied claims by a scientist who worked on the atomic project that the city will remain lethally radioactive for 70 years. They say the bomb was exploded high enough above the city for the radioactive fallout to have been dispersed into the atmosphere and around the globe. Whatever the long-term effects of the two atomic explosions, it's already evident that this horrific new weapon is likely to change the whole future of warfare. Here at home, to mark his disapproval of the dropping of the atomic bomb, the Dean of St Albans has banned the use of the Abbey for a service of thanksgiving. No victory peals were rung from the Abbey Tower today. The Dean, the very Reverend C.C. C. Thickness, said, I cannot honestly give thanks to God for an event brought about by an act of wholesale indiscriminate massacre. Still to come on this Victory Day news, Britain's coal mines are to be nationalised by Mr Attlee's new Labour government. So is the Bank of England. The plans were set out in the King's Speech opening Parliament this morning. In Paris, Marshal Pétain, the head of state of Vichy France, has been condemned to death for collaborating with Nazi Germany. Les jurés ont parlé. Oui, Pétain est coupable. Oui, Pétain mérite la mort. And it played a greater part in our victory than the atom bomb. Tonight we can reveal the war-winning secrets of radar. Today has not only been the first day of peace, it's also seen the state opening of the first new parliament for ten years, and His Majesty's speech was one of the longest for many years. Foremost among the policies of the new Labour government are bills to nationalise the Bank of England and the country's coal mines. The King and Queen defied this morning's drizzle with cheerful insouciance, in keeping perhaps with Mr Attlee's dreams for a brave new world of socialism, which King George was about to present to Parliament. In the event, the King's speech did not spell out precisely what the Cabinet hoped to gain from nationalisation. Coal has long taken pride of place in Labour's plans for public ownership.
The party's first scheme to nationalise the mines was hatched in the 1920s. With coal and coal miners, labour convictions about capitalist exploitation join hands with the concept of public control of key industries in the national interest. Yet coal, as we remember only too sadly from wartime strikes and shortages, is a black spot, an ailing industry where production is declining, investment in short supply and relations between workforce and owners sour and embittered. Compensation to today's owners could be a vexed question. Will today's mine managers stay put and if not, who will replace them? The proposal to nationalise the Bank of England came as no surprise either. Mr Attlee and his cohorts have never concealed their desire to seize, as they say, the commanding heights of the economy. With the bank comes the Royal Mint and control of the money supply. A further priority is housing, cited in the King's speech as urgent. There are plans to mass-produce temporary homes, one scheme, already underway, begins in the graveyard of scrapped aircraft. The junk is gathered, dismantled, tossed into a furnace, melted down and turned into building blocks, which, with a wave of a magic wand, are transformed in turn into kitchens, bathrooms and living rooms. But who will pay? The war has emptied the national coffers. Britain is all but broke. Just after four o'clock this morning in the Palais de Justice in Paris, Marshal Pétain, the former head of state of Vichy France, was sentenced to death and national dishonour. But the presiding judge added a plea for clemency in view of Pétain's age. He's 89. It's expected that General de Gaulle will commute the sentence on Pétain, who was a hero of the First World War, to one of life imprisonment. The trial ended in high drama. Les jurés ont parlé. Oui. Pétain est coupable. Oui, Pétain mérite la mort. It had taken the jury six hours to decide that Henri-Philippe Pétain was guilty of intelligence with the enemy, although they concluded there was insufficient evidence to convict him of plotting against the security of the French state. The hearing lasted nearly three weeks at an estimated cost of £1,000 a day. General de Gaulle is said to have asked for a speedy resolution of a trial that has sometimes seemed less about justice than national anger. The presiding judge is a former member of the Vichy regime and recommended clemency, but many of the 24 jurymen had served in the resistance, some are communists. The witnesses included Paul Renault, who was Premier of France in 1940 when the Germans broke through. In his evidence, he called Marshal Pétain a traitor and accused him of plotting the downfall of France. The Premier of the Vichy regime, Pierre Laval, sometimes dubbed Pétain's evil genius, was brought back from internment in Barcelona to appear, despite objections from Pétain's defence. Looking weary but still wearing his trademark white tie, Laval argued that collaboration was forced upon us and was inevitable. Laval is to face his own trial in the autumn. Pétain showed no emotion at the announcement of the verdict. At the outset, he refused a defence of mental incapacity, but his frailty is apparent. The proceedings of the trial and its dramatic conclusion seem to have left him bewildered. After the trial, Pétain was flown to a fortress prison at Pau in the Pyrenees. A ten-year secret was lifted today with the disclosure of the story of Britain's war-winning weapon, radar. According to Sir Stafford Cripps, President of the Board of Trade, it's played a greater part in the war than the atom bomb. It's probably the biggest secret ever kept. The existence of radar was well known to tens of thousands of men and women in the armed forces, but until today no one has publicly admitted the existence of a British invention which helped to win the war. Radar is short for radio detection and ranging, and it works like an invisible light. A revolving radio transmitter sends out radio waves which, when they hit something solid, such as a plane or ship, bounce back. The time taken by this echo to arrive gives the range, and with every sweep of the radar transmitter, the operators can plot the speed and direction of the target. It's not affected by weather, can penetrate fog, cloud and pitch darkness, and enables trained plotters to see very long distances, well over a hundred miles. It was radar which enabled the Spitfires and Hurricanes of RAF Fighter Command to win the Battle of Britain. German raiders were being tracked long before they reached even the French coast. And it was radar which enabled the RAF's night fighters to intercept and shoot down German bombers in total darkness. 
At the time, the Air Ministry suggested Group Captain Katzai's Cunningham's phenomenal success was due to a diet of raw carrots. Radar was also used by coastal command squadrons to detect surface German U-boats. Sometimes planes were directed to the scene by ground controllers, but many planes carried their own sets. Although the submarines would invariably crash dive, it was usually too late. Radar was the brainchild of a top British scientist, Sir Robert Watson Watt, and was developed shortly before the war. British-built sets were supplied to the Americans and Russians when they joined the war against Hitler. With the coming of peace, radar will have huge potential benefits, especially for air traffic control and for the navigation of airliners and merchant shipping. But experts say it probably won't be much use for cars or trains. The move from a wartime to a peacetime economy will speed up tomorrow when the government is expected to announce the transfer of more workers from war industries to peacetime work. It's women who will be most affected. They've filled the places of men in industry. Virtually all single adult women have been working, and a poll has shown that more than 60% of them want to go on working. But many may have to move aside when the men return. The message from the factory and the shop floor is that women are reluctant to return to hearth and home after their sterling work towards the war effort. 80% of married women engineers want to stay on the job, according to their trades union. But with the return of soldiers from the front, there's a new battle underway for the industrial jobs which women filled so competently. One woman delegate told her union conference, we got the vote out of the last war, what will women get out of this war? Economic equality? The answer seems to be that all women are now starting out on the path towards financial equality with the passage of the historic Family Allowances Bill. Now it's not just the woman who clocks on in the factory who'll be paid, the government has officially recognised the status of motherhood by allowing women to draw the sum of five shillings a week for each child. Women have always managed the housekeeping and there was a virtually unanimous decision in Parliament that the money should be drawn by the mother in the family, not the father. That way it would be sure to benefit the children. This significant social change was hastened by the war. MPs have declared that the mothers of this country added to their power and prestige by their efforts during the last five years and it's only right they should win the recognition of the nation. The end of the World War has also meant the worst queues in Britain since the war began. Prime Minister Attlee's announcement at midnight that we deserve a double bank holiday has caught many housewives unawares. They were suddenly faced with catering for two days holiday and the day began, like so many war days, in queues. Queues for bread, queues for vegetables, queues for fish. The multiple grocers were generally closed but private traders opened up for the morning. The experience gave fresh impetus to the growing national cry to stop queues. The government's answer to protesters is that it's a shortage of people rather than food which is causing the problem. There's not enough on sale because there are too few bakers, land workers and fishermen at work. But fishing boats are soon to be released, says the government, from war duties and they'll get back to supplying the daily catch. But that's not action enough for the housewife's champion, Mrs. Lovelock, who's happy to admit that she's the inspiration behind all the protests across the nation. Yes, and I do believe that a nationwide rising of the housewives would end this terrible curse of queuing. Without the British housewife, this war could never have been won. We have suffered enough. Surely we should not be asked to put up with any more. It was announced yesterday that the weekly allowance of cheese, bacon, egg and milk will not be reduced despite those shortages and prices will continue to be subsidised. The sugar ration will remain at 8 ounces per person per week and costs 4 pence a pound. The tea allowance stays at 2.5 ounces at a price of 2 and 10 pence a pound. Butter, we're allowed two ounces a week at one and eight a pound, and we're allowed one pound two and a quarter ounces of meat at one and a penny a pound. All those prices are, of course, subject to availability. 
And as the lights come on again in London, West End theatres are responding to the demand for plenty of variety. Max Miller, Jimmy James and Dick Henderson are topping the bill at the Prince of Wales in fast-moving music hall entertainment. The windmill is living up to its motto, We Never Close, as it presents the 186th edition of its Review de Ville, and it's playing to packed houses. And on the other side of the Atlantic, Lieutenant Henry Fonda, the American film star who joined the Navy after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, was today given the Bronze Star for services to his country. Fonda was an air combat intelligence officer with the Pacific Fleet. It seems that Britons who are having their first real summer holiday for five years are not counting the cost. There are new queues now and they're outside the banks in places like Brighton, Blackpool and Torquay as local traders line up to pay in their takings. As one bank manager put it, it's just like a gold rush, only it's coming in. Yes, we do like to be beside the seaside and it's even more fun when we haven't been here for quite a while. Since 1940, Britain's beaches have been out of bounds, some of them even mined. But now, with the threat of invasion lifted, those pre-war pleasures of sea, sand, and, if you're lucky, a bit of sun, can be enjoyed once more. Londoners, wearied by the Blitz, and more recently those dreaded flying bombs, are pleased to find that here in Brighton, nothing much has changed while they've been away. The familiar landmarks are all here, and the sea air hasn't changed much either it still sends you to sleep. This summer, our popular resorts have been full of holidaymakers once again, and the seaside landladies are breathing a sigh of relief. Business has been bad during the war years. Holidays were the last thing on our minds. And it's not just the landladies who are happy. So too are the fishermen. Wartime restrictions at an end, we've rediscovered our appetite for seafood. And the good news is that the government has still not invented rationing for whelks and mussels. Popular as ever, that halfway house between land and sea, the pier. Gone are the days when everything cost a penny, but it's still the best place in town for enjoying some of the beauties of the seaside. Here in Blackpool, as in Brighton, they're having their best year since 1939. The beach is now crowded with people who've done as much as anyone for the war effort. Many of these holidaymakers are the very factory workers who turned out Spitfires and Lancasters, tanks and munitions of every kind. Strangely comforting to find that even the fat lady is still in town. Now I wonder what she's been doing for the war effort. And the main news once again, a world war which has lasted for six years and claimed an estimated 56 million lives is over. Ahead are the new challenges of building what the Prime Minister has described as a world of freedom, democracy, social justice and peace. Tonight the Allied nations are celebrating what the King has described as an overpowering sense of deliverance. We close our coverage in this bulletin with the scenes in Piccadilly Circus, where the BBC's Winford Vaughan Thomas has joined the crowds. From the studio in London, good night. We're back now in Piccadilly Circus, into a Piccadilly Circus which now is crowded as it's never been crowded before. There's literally now not a single place where you can get anybody else in. In fact, the trouble is to get people out because the fireworks are exploding in all directions, bonfires have been lighted, people are dancing on the rooftops, they're climbing up the sky signs opposite me, one sailor climbed the whole way up and down again, the terrific excitement of the crowd, and as for the noise of it, well, listen for yourselves to central London's VJ Raw.